Welcome everybody, this is Katie Wallace and tonight's webinar is on vitamin D and sun exposure. I have that it's six o'clock, so I'm gonna go ahead and get started. This is actually a talk I've given in person um, to some other audiences and tonight I tried to add a little bit of information to make it applicable to the current situation. So we're gonna cover fun facts about the sunshine vitamin. I'm going to talk about uh, what vitamin D does for our health and how it protects against disease and death. And um, also how you can achieve optimal vitamin D levels. There's a lot of uh, different approaches, the benefits of sunlight. So uh, it's not just about vitamin D. There's really a lot of benefits to the sun. And I think we miss a lot if we just focus on vitamin D. And we'll also talk about some of the negative impacts of artificial light. Um, versus the benefits of natural light. So I have everyone muted um, in order to get through the presentation, but please, if you have any questions or wanna share anything, you can use the chat. Um, if you kind of wiggle your mouse, you'll probably see a chat option. So I'll have some time at the end of the lecture for questions there. So vitamin D, is sometimes called the sunshine vitamin. And it's made from a cholesterol-based molecule in the skin that absorbs UVB radiation. So that's ultraviolet radiation from the sun. And this is converted to something called pre-vitamin D3, which then in turn gets rearranged into um, the vitamin D3 that we talk about. And then there's actually an inactive form of that that's more like a storage and a biologically active form of D3. Most of the light that's made into vitamin D is made in the outer layers of the skin. So, and it's very resilient. Washing your skin doesn't, doesn't change. Um, it's kind of a, a pretty cool thing that our bodies are designed to do. I'm in Madison, Wisconsin. And we are at 43 degrees latitude. And so like most Northern places, because um, of how much UV radiation we don't get in the winter, we can't actually make any uh, vitamin D between November and February. So the reason for this is that there's something called a, a stratospheric ozone layer. So up there in the atmosphere, um, the ozone absorbs most of the ultraviolet radiation coming towards the earth and only 1% reaches the surface. So in the winter, we get even less ultraviolet than at other times of year. And that's why it's very difficult to um, make vitamin D in the skin. Um, and you couple that with our um, indoor lifestyle, then it gets even harder um, to make vitamin D, especially if we're dressed um, modestly, you know, covering up. Um, even in, in the summer, we're really not um, able to make that much vitamin D just through limited exposure to the ultraviolet rays. So this is a calendar that I thought was interesting just to demonstrate what I'm talking about. So uh, if you look at the row that says 35 to 50 degrees north and below, that's um, where we are in Madison, Wisconsin. I know some people like, hi, Tina, are um, watching from Florida. Um, so that would be um, in the row just below the one I mentioned. But you can see if there's a white circle, a clear circle, that means you're not making any vitamin D. If there's an orange circle, so for example, um, in Wisconsin's latitude from March, April, May, are all orange, September, October. That means so-so. You can make so-so levels of vitamin D then. If you see a red, that means awesome. So three months out of 12 months is the only time in um, both where I am and where um, my cousin Tina is in Florida that we can make awesome amounts of vitamin D. Now, certainly the more so-so time you've got, like in Florida, you can, you can um, increase your vitamin D stores then, but you get the idea that it really is a pretty small window um, for getting this very valuable vitamin as you move further away from the equator. So we think historically that people who live closer to the poles 
where there's minimal exposure to light made up for this by eating vitamin D foods. So um, foods basically from animals that made their own vitamin D. So one thing to think about, because I think most of us are trained to put some sunscreen on and think about protecting ourselves from the sun. If you put sunscreen on um, of an SPF of 30, that's absorbing almost all of the UV radiation. And so you're not making any vitamin D when you're in the sun with that type of sunscreen. So I wanna back up a little bit and talk about the science and our understanding of vitamin D and health. So Niels Ryberg Finson was a, a doctor who won the Nobel Prize in 1903 for using sunlight to treat people with a certain type of tuberculosis. And as people looked more closely at the relationship between sunlight and disease, they began to understand that people who live in northern latitudes um, or southern latitudes, if you're thinking of um, below the equator, the further you get towards the poles, basically, you have an increased risk for death from cancer. And a number of studies have also shown that people who have the vitamin D deficiency, they don't have enough vitamin D, have an increased risk of a number of different types of cancers. So it seems like if you live in a place without a lot of sunlight and you have a deficiency, um, then the odds are you're going to have a higher risk of disease. Well, the good news is that it does seem from some studies, this is controversial, and I'll talk a little bit more about this, that vitamin D supplementation does reduce the risk of, um, in studies of cancer. So um, this one study reported in 2015 showed a 70% reduction for all cancer 50% uh, reduction for prostate cancer. And this is when given about uh, 4,000 international units of vitamin D daily, and they did not report any negative effects of supplementation. So that's good news. So it's also important to get more sunlight for reducing our risk for autoimmunity. And there's a number of studies, again, that kind of show the same thing that we saw with cancer, that the further away from the equator you are, the more likely you are to develop an autoimmune problem. So one of the reasons we think that this is, is that vitamin D modulates the immune system. And so uh, just to explain what modulation means, uh, if we have an immune system that's under stress, um, it's going to freak out about um, little things that maybe don't matter and, or maybe it's freaking out about important things, but it can't really differentiate what's really important and what's minor. And when it does start to attack, it's kind of bouncing off the walls. So I like to use this analogy with my kids on the left. This is Marion and Allison. Okay, they're normal kids, but if they're not supervised, you know, they might get a little hyper. They might get a little crazy. They might be tearing down those curtains or, you know, just making a mess of everything. Um, they don't know, they don't clean up after themselves, you know, unless there's an adult there. So you can think of that like that overly aggressive immune system. It's just kind of out of control. But what vitamin D does is it comes in and it helps the immune system to make better choices. So you see on the right, here's my mom. She's like vitamin D. She comes in, the children are very well behaved. Um, you know, it, they um, are behaving the way that they should. So this lack of immune modulation is um, a key component of autoimmune disease and the deficiency of vitamin C has been linked to increased um, risk for type one diabetes, MS, lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, IBS, um, a number of different autoimmune diseases. So vitamin D keeps uh, another thing that vitamin D does, and this is particularly important right now in our current situation with the coronavirus, is that it keeps our barriers strong. So, you know, we have natural protections to viruses. It's uh, our skin and also our um, lining of our digestive system and our oral cavity. And so if we have good levels of vitamin D, 
then it's much harder for viruses to penetrate um, the different barriers, both the mucosal lining in our upper airways, our oral cavities, as well as our digestive system. And vitamin D also helps our body to fight viruses and it keeps our lungs healthy. So we know from studies of coronaviruses, so different coronaviruses besides COVID-19, that vitamin D deficiencies contribute to the development of a more acute uh, situation with respiratory distress, and that levels below 50 might predispose someone to getting into more severe uh, respiratory distress situation. And we also know that a vitamin D deficiency results in greater injury to the lungs when someone does have a coronavirus or something similar. This is some of the newest data available about COVID-19 and vitamin D. Took me a minute to look at this to understand it, but basically if you look at the green, the green are people who have vitamin D levels that are normal. They're not deficient. So here that's um, normal is considered levels higher than 30. And you can see most of the green people are in the mild category. So if you have medically normal vitamin D, you, the, in, the, in this set of data, those people had mild symptoms. And then you look at the people who are deficient, who are red and orange, so below 30 units of vitamin D, this would be like on your standard vitamin D blood test that you can get from a health practitioner. You see they're much more likely to have critical, severe, or even just a normal response to COVID-19. So, so we can summarize from this preliminary data that vitamin D is really helpful in reducing the severity of people's symptoms when they do catch a virus. To move on to other things, light exposure helps reduce um, high blood pressure. So when people did a study where they exposed to UV light, it helped improve their vitamin D levels and helped reduce their hypertension. Um, vitamin D deficiency also puts us at a higher risk for heart attack by as much as 50%. And the deficiency is associated with more than 100% increased risk of dying from a heart attack. So it seems to be very important for the cardiovascular system. And here's all these other things. I could spend all night probably talking about vitamin D deficiencies, but I don't want to do that. Um, so issues with pregnancy, um, issues with blood sugar control, cardiovascular, you know, healthy heart, um, mental health issues, cognition, um, all of these things are associated with not having enough vitamin D. This is from the Weston A. Price Foundation website. If you're not familiar with them, they're a nonprofit organization, international organization uh, that talks about um, ancestral foods and um, uh, it's a good resource for information. So anyway, um, this is just a summary table for all of the diseases uh, which vitamin D is suggested to protect. So you can see there's a big list there. And I wanted to add this statistic of the 30 leading causes of death in the US, 19 of the leading causes of death are linked to vitamin D deficiency. Pretty interesting. And one more here, avoidance of sun exposure is a risk factor of similar magnitude as smoking in terms of life expectancy. So this was a study done in Sweden and basically they looked at um, people that avoided the sun and people that didn't. And the people who um, did avoid the sun were more likely to die. So why is vitamin D so important? I already talked about some of the things that it does, but basically it's an enabler. It's really important in a bunch of cellular functions in the body, so many. Many, many cellular functions in all the body systems rely on uh, vitamin D. So we're just not going to work at optimal potential and be much more likely to, um, you know, combined especially with other issues, um, lead to disease if, if we don't have this very important um, vitamin in our body. 
So it, I mentioned it helps protect our oral cavity from the <laughs> coronavirus potentially and, and our digestive system. The studies that have um, looked at vitamin D and gut health show that it helps increase the expression of, of a number of the tight junction proteins that hold the gut cells together. So the gut lining is just a single cell layer. There's only one cell layer between you and your bloodstream and what's in your gut. And it's um, vulnerable to stress and um, you know various stresses in our environment today. So if we have adequate vitamin D, our gut cells are able to hold the line much better. Um, they have also shown in studies that the vitamin D controls inflammation in the gut cells. Uh, so again, it's, it's modulating the immune response so we don't get out of control and have inflammation. And it seemed to also help improve the number of beneficial bacteria and keep down those that are uh, pathogenic. So some interesting preliminary findings with vitamin D in the gut. I'm sure there's a whole lot more to learn. <clears throat> so um, I mentioned that there's a couple different forms of D3 in the body. And so before I move on to talking about supplementation, I just want to make sure that this is, um, you know, that you have an introduction to this. So the 25 hydroxy vitamin D is what we typically test. And this is what experts would call our storage vitamins. So if you go in for a, a vitamin D blood test, this is what they're testing. And um, it is converted by the body to 125 D hydroxy vitamin D, which is the biologically active form. And so that just becomes important when we're talking about what are we, what are we measuring and what does that mean for having vitamin D available for our body. Optimal vitamin, or sorry, optimal levels of D also have a very important role in our skeletal system. So I didn't want to pass up the opportunity uh, just to talk about how vitamin D helps us absorb more calcium from our food um, and helps maintain adequate levels in the blood. This is much, um, this, this helps with not pulling minerals out of the bone in order to balance the blood, which can happen um, over time. So vitamin D can help with mineralizing the bone because it's making more minerals available in general in the body. And it can also help with bone um, re regrowth, remodeling. Unfortunately, 70% of adults in America are deficient in vitamin D. So you just heard all the things that happen or can happen when someone's deficient. So this is kind of an alarming statistic. So if we wanted to do something about that, well, how do we know what a good level is? And it turns out that different experts say different things. So there's a vitamin D consul who says, for optimal health, you need to be between 40 and 80. Endocrine Society says 40 and 60. The Institute of Medicine, whose goal really isn't optimal health, it's more on helping you avoid a severe disease, rickets, which is where you can't form bones at all, says you need to have at least 20. Functional medicine um, is a, a field of holistic medicine. Our level's typically a little higher between 60 and 80. Um, Chris Masterjohn, who writes about vitamin D, I included his level in here. He's with the Weston A. Price Foundation, um, and he's had some interesting things to say. And he says 35 to 50 is a good range. And if you have adequate levels of vitamin A and K, it's safe to be at a higher level. So unfortunately, we don't have a lot of data on what a natural level of vitamin D is for someone who's not living a modern lifestyle, perhaps, who, who's outside. So there was this, um, a couple of studies based out of Africa, and they found that the mean vitamin D level was 48. So um, I would suggest keeping in mind that this is a level for people with darker skin um, who um, are living at a low, lower latitude. They, they live near the equator. And so they're not going to need the same type of storage as somebody who lives in a northern latitude because their lifestyle is 
going outside every day, every day, all year round, they, because they live by the equator, they can um, be sure that they're gonna be able to make vitamin D that they need. So just keep that in mind, their storage level is probably lower, actually, than someone at a higher latitude might need it to be because um, they simply don't need to store very much. We have another uh, study done in St. Louis, and this was done with sunbathing lifeguards, and their natural levels ranged from 50 to 80. And so that's pretty much it for our studies of vitamin D. We don't have a lot, but from what we've got, I would just say here on the right, this is my family um, in the summer, and you can see how we're all covered up. We're camping in the boundary waters. Um, not gonna make as much vitamin D even in the summer, right? Um, uh, as you are. Um, so my argument would be, you actually need to have higher levels of vitamin D if you live further north than you do if you need to live near the equator. Although obviously for all, some, uh, some basic level of vitamin D um, that's healthy is going to be required. So there's a lot of information out there about what to supplement with. Um, I think a lot of the experts in the research I read agreed that 6,000 units daily is what is needed for most people for their physiological needs. Um, this one study showed 4,800, close to 5,000, um, was what was needed daily to prevent autoimmune disease. I, here in Wisconsin, um, suggest people test their level of vitamin D, because if you don't test, you don't really know, and it can be quite variable uh, between one person and the next. But I typically suggest 10,000 um, for adults, um, and for kids, uh, you know, the level's going to be much lower. And then retest. Some people, when they take a supplement, their, their levels are going to very gradually increase over time. And another person might increase very rapidly. And so it's very important to choose a level of supplementation and then test your level again so you know how you're doing. People with a higher body mass index are often going to need three to five times as much vitamin D. And as I mentioned, it's really important to, to test it. You can get testing done in this area for $45. Well, how much is too much? Okay, if we start supplementing, do we need to be worried about taking too much? There's not actually very good information available about this, in my opinion. I, I think that's because it's pretty rare for people to have a problem, but um, Toxicity perhaps can result from levels above 150, and this can perhaps be attributed to supplementing at levels of higher than 40,000 units daily. So some of the supplementation levels I talked at are much, much lower than this and fairly safe um, to start with. And uh, here's the interesting thing. Toxicity can't occur um, if you have adequate vitamin A and vitamin K. And the reason for this is that vitamin D is an enabler in all those chemical processes. And if you have adequate vitamin A and vitamin K, then everything just keeps working. And you, if, you, um, if you don't have enough A and K, then here's the theory that um, if your vitamin D gets too high, you the actual signs of hypertoxicity are actually a, design, a sign that you're deficient in vitamin A and K. So I'll say that again. <laughs> if your vitamin D level is to get too high, the only time you would have a problem would be if you actually began to develop a deficiency in vitamin A and K. So all of the problems that go with having low A and K come from having um, <clears throat> having too much D, that makes sense. So they, they depend on each other. So you can choose a supplement if you're going to supplement that includes vitamin A and vitamin K. Um, and you can also ask for blood tests for these levels. Um, Chris Masterjohn suggests an ideal ratio of A to D that is between four and eight. So you can actually get your vitamin A level tested with your doctor as well as vitamin D and calculate the ratio and um, see how you're doing. 
Um, so let's say you're somebody who actually likes taking more vitamin D. Maybe you want your level to be at the higher end, like around 80. You can just check and see, do I have enough vitamin A? Uh, and then no, you know, rest assured if you do, or if you don't, then you know, oh, you know, maybe I'm taking too much D and I need to think about getting more A from my diet or um, supplement or whatever. So, um, <clears throat> so vitamin K is an especially um, interesting vitamin. All, all three of these vitamins are very important uh, right now with our current situation with the coronavirus. Um, vitamin A is an immune modulator, just like vitamin D. So it can help a lot with um, early and, and later stages of the coronavirus and having a healthy outcome. And vitamin K um, also appears to be important. Uh, this is a study that just came out that showed that low vitamin K status seemed to be correlated with worse outcomes for COVID-19 patients. So it, it appears that vitamin K, as you know, it's an enabler, so it's gonna be involved in many body systems, but um, it appears that it has a special role in lung tissue, keeping lung tissue healthy. So there's many options out there for vitamin D supplementation and also some criticisms of supplementation. I'll talk about it in a minute. I like this Ultra D5000. This is a fish oil supplement that includes A and D. Um, and, and so it's, it's a nice way to kind of get everything you might need and it's a liquid form, very clean. Um, otherwise, the vitamin D drops are always good options. Those are helpful, especially with kids or people who um, don't want to swallow capsules. And a lot of, you know, there's other capsules available, obviously, at varying dosages. So, so a lot of good options out there. There's also food-based sources of vitamin D. So if you like liver and you like eggs, that's another good way to increase the amount of vitamin D coming in. Here's some more vitamin D foods. So some of the um, fish liver um, is especially high. Salmon, herring, eggs again. Um, so a number of, of uh, foods are high in vitamin D naturally. And pastured animals versus animals raised in a uh, factory are also going to be um, higher in vitamin D in general. Um, so for example, in, in lard, um, which is the fat from pork, uh, pork that have been pastured are going to have 500 units of vitamin D in a teaspoon versus conventional lard is only going to have 13 units of vitamin D. So the animals are going outside, um, so their, their body is going to have more vitamin D, and that's going to give people um, better um, health benefits too. <clears throat> so it's not only good for the animals, it's also good for the consumers um, to uh, support sustainable, humane practices. So I want to talk a little bit about the controversies about vitamin D supplementation. This is a study that came out just last year in 2019. Big, big study that showed that uh, the people who took uh, so they had, they had placebo groups who didn't take anything, and then they had people taking um, vitamin D at a level of 2,000 IU daily, and they found that there was no effect on highly invasive cancer or um, severe cases of cardiovascular disease. <clears throat> so that was kind of an interesting um, finding, and people are talking about that. I mean, my thought on that is, well, based on what we know about the research on what kind of levels you of uh, um, vitamin D you need to take to potentially get a positive outcome. Well, this, this study was just generally too low. Um, also, my impression of this study was that they looked at the sickest people. And so, sure, vitamin D can be important, but it's only really one piece in helping people who are very, very sick to have a better outcome. You gotta be thinking about blood sugar control, <clears throat> immune modulation, um, you know, gut health. There's just so many things that are important in the, and that are involved in the development of serious disease beyond just vitamin D. But I think the take-home message here too is that 
you know, maybe there's some, something about someone's high vitamin D status and their health that goes beyond just getting vitamin D, just having high vitamin D. I would say, let's look at vitamin D more as an indicator of someone's health. Maybe it's just an indicator of sun exposure. And maybe there's a lot of other benefits to sun that we're missing. It's not just about vitamin D. So uh, along those lines, obviously going outside and getting sun exposure would be great, but I, I showed you the map and <clears throat> um, not all of us can, can make vitamin D for part of the year. So you can get a vitamin D lamp. This is a spurty lamp. So this, there are other ones out there, but um, I have a lamp like this. Um, and you just um, stand in front of it and use eye protection. And this can help raise your vitamin D levels without um, supplementation. And this is basically just a UV light. So you're getting numerous benefits from the light besides just the vitamin D. So we're gonna talk about what some of those are. So it turns out when we're exposed to sunlight in general, our skin cells produce beta endorphins. So these are op opioid peptides that make us feel good. And they're really good for our immune system. They're good for our gut. There's a chemical, there are numerous chemical reactions that happen at a cellular level when we're in the light. It's not just about vitamin D. We get pain relief, we feel relaxed, wounds heal better. And one of the things uh, that also happens is that we produce something called nitric oxide, a beneficial form of nitric oxide. And that's really good for circulation. It modulates and helps the immune system. It's good for our nervous system. So I think some people are looking at that study that showed that that minimal level of supplementation didn't do anything and saying, well, you know, people actually need to be in the light, not just taking vitamin D in order to get these health benefits. So what do we do? Because most, most health advocates are telling us to stay away from the sun. Um, so, you know, this is something, uh, you know, I I'm usually preface my talk, but I guess I forgot to preface it tonight by saying that I'm a health educator, I'm not a medical doctor, and uh, I'm talking about this stuff only from the perspective of a um, health education. And um, you know, you should obviously have a conversation about this with your doctor if you're somebody who has a situation where you're at um, higher risk when you're in the sun. Um, but most of these health organizations are telling us use sunscreen or avoid the sun. And this is really at odds with a lot of the potential health benefits that we can achieve when we're in the sun and when we get more vitamin D. So I think, um, I think for most people, getting more sunlight would be better. Uh, and I think there are some cases where people are going to need to be very careful about being in the sun. Um, so, um, you know, that needs to be addressed on an individual level. But from my reading, what I understand um, is that the biggest predictor for all types of skin cancer is painful sunburns before the age of 20. Um, so I think, you know, this potentially leaves some room to discuss, um, you know, getting more sunlight. And, um, you know, so long as you go out there and you're not getting burnt, um, it, it's relative, it's safe for most people and very beneficial. So there are some other things about the light that are really helpful for us. So I wanna finish the talk by um, first talking about thyroid health. So the morning sunlight is highest in the red end of the light spectrum. So the light spectrum is um, like a rainbow from, from one end to the other. And the red end is uh, red and near infrared and infrared. And it turns out that in the morning and also at dusk, the red spectrum is naturally strongest. And the studies have found that uh, we make thyroid hormone when we're stimulated by that spectrum of the sun, in addition to the other um, nutrients and components we need. And so some people actually use a special red light therapy uh, to help with um, controlling autoimmune thyroiditis, 
and um, in this study actually they uh, did get a, a number of people were um, after they used the red light therapy they were able to stop taking their thyroid medication so that's pretty profound I'm not suggesting that you do that on your own but I think it's an interesting um, finding about the role of the, the red light and thyroid hormone, of course, is important for every cell. I have a uh, thyroid talk, so maybe if there's interest, I could do the thyroid webinar. Um, but uh, it's very important for hair. And so this here is my daughter, Marion, with all this hair. So go outside, get some morning sunlight. Stop taking other things for your hair. Just get some more sunlight. <laughs> Light also is really important for the adrenal hormones. Uh, adrenal hormones are um, made in the adrenal glands which are little kind of grape-sized glands on the kidneys and they make all of our stress hormones and for women they are the really kind of responsible for making our baseline level of our sex hormones so yes the ovaries make a lot of sex hormones for us too but the adrenals are very very critical and guess what you have to have light sunlight natural light to get your adrenals to be healthy. So I think people's awareness of increased stress hormones and cortisol, it has grown. And one of the best ways that you can help to establish healthy levels of stress hormones is to get outside more. And then there's melatonin. Melatonin is a key hormone that responds to light. So basically when we're in natural light, we make, um, we make more melatonin. Um, and that melatonin seems like it's really, really important for our health. Uh, it protects the mitochondrial DNA and it helps keep inflammation in check um, and controls a number of important functions inside the cells. So without melatonin, uh, we can't make the biogenic amines like dopamine, serotonin, adrenaline, histamine. All of these are built um, photoelectrically, so from light. And um, if, we, if we don't have healthy melatonin production, um, then we're going to suffer and we're not going to be able to sleep very well. And I, I mentioned that melatonin is really important for mitochondrial health. Um, mitochondria, you might remember from high school biology, is the organelle inside the cell that helps make ATP, which is our primary uh, energy, source of energy in the cell. Um, <clears throat> so you wanna have melatonin in order to have good cellular function, both in terms of the energy that you feel and that your body has to be resilient in different situations. Also, if um, you needed to respond to a situation like you caught a virus or had cancer, it's the mitochondria that signal that the body is infected or that cell is infected and the cell needs to die. So it's very important in controlling infections. It directs things that happen in the rest of the cell and the communication that happens between cells and tissues. And so the mitochondrial health is a huge factor in, um, in keeping us healthy and avoiding, um, avoiding diseases. Uh, in this uh, study, the scientists were actually able to reverse aging and stop disease processes by um, controlling the mitochondria. And so melatonin, through our exposure to light, gives us a lot of power and control over um, the health of our body. Unfortunately, uh, here we are in front of the computer, um, <clears throat> and the computers and the LED lights, the fluorescent lights, most of our man-made lights now emit a lot of blue light. And so blue light is very damaging to melatonin. So basically, if you're looking at your cell phone, you're looking at the computer screen all day, you're indoors under artificial light, 
it's suppressing your melatonin production and you're not going to get um, all those different benefits that melatonin provides. The blue light also increases our risk for obesity and our risk for insulin sensitivity. And so basically, instead of being outside getting the UV and the infrared light that's so good for us, um, we're, we've reversed our natural environment to be something that's damaging. So the good news is, though, there's a lot of things you can do. You can be proactive. Um, you can get a blue light blocker on your smartphone. All the smartphones I've seen just have a blue light blocker that's right there in the phone under the settings. Um, iPhones, uh, actually, you can actually increase the red light on the screen. I don't have one, but I've seen it. Um, you can get these blue blocker glasses. I'm wearing glasses in this picture. And you can see that they're tinted a little yellow. They block the blue light. And I would say, you know, I, I had read about these blue blocker glasses and I just decided to get my new prescription done with the blue blocker lens, which was actually cheaper than a regular lens would have been. Um, tell within a week that I was dreaming a lot more and sleeping more soundly. So I was surprised, um, but I continue to sleep much better with this prescription with the blue blocker. If you don't wear glasses, you can just get a pair of blue blocker that's non-prescription glasses and you can wear them um, at night um, if you're at home, but you've got the lights on or you're watching TV. And so it'll help reduce the stimulating effect of that artificial blue light that's basically blocking your melatonin production. You can also go outside. <laughs> So um, I was inspired by this group, Thousand Hours Outside Madison. So you can find something like this in your community. And I've still got my chart going. I didn't update it, but I'm, I'm almost halfway through my chart now. I've been um, logging the hours. I go outside every day. And, um, you know, it's not perfect. I don't know if I'm going to make it to a thousand hours this year because I think that's it's between two and three hours every day. And I definitely wasn't doing that in January. Um, but it's making me more aware and it's um, helping me to spend more time outside. And that's the goal is just to, you know, be more aware and do a little better than you were doing before. Uh, you can also get a red light. The red light helps with boosting melatonin production specifically. And you can get a light bulb for as little as $10. You can go to this website, saunaspace.com. They have good um, bulbs there that are good quality with um, minimal um, extra EMF, which is important if you're buying a bulb. You want to make sure that it's been tested and it's not uh, sending out a bunch of other radiation that you don't want when you're under the bulb. But um, please note that it does require um, a special lamp if you get this bulb because it's hot. It's going to get hot. So you don't want to make a fire. So you want to get, get an extra. Um, a uh, heat lamp for it. Like you can get a $15 heat lamp at Home Depot. And you can use the lamp for a lot of things. It can help with resetting your circadian rhythm. So if you're sleepy in the morning, it can help you with waking up. If you have a hard time going to sleep at night, it can help you with going to sleep more quickly. Um, it can help with a lot of issues with cellular health. Um, so um, just lots and lots of application, probably too much to go into in this talk, um, but it can also help with the hormone, thyroid hormone production and pain relief too. So it's really great if you have an injured area um, to use the near infrared light bulb for that. This is just a picture of the setup that I have. I lie on an infrared mat. Infrared saunas are also great and have a lot of health benefits, but I've got a mat and then I have the light overhead and I just read under that at night before I go to bed. So here we are at the end. Vitamin D is really critical to health, but harder to make the further away from the equator you are. And sunlight is critical to health. So I hope you got the message that besides vitamin D, we're beginning to see that there's other things about the sunlight that are very important. So probably the best thing you can do 
is go outside and get natural sunlight. That's the best way to increase your vitamin D. Or, or you can use a lamp, which again is like you making the vitamin D. Um, and someone told me that, you know, if you just take a vitamin D supplement, it's kind of like having someone do your push-ups for you, right? So you might, maybe you might look good, but you're not getting any of the benefits, or the cellular benefits of actually making it. Um, and I, I think that the more I read about vitamin D, uh, the more that I'm beginning to agree with that. I do think though that supplementation can have a really important role. I do still, when I'm working with with people, with clients, and we're talking about vitamin D levels or different things they can do when they're um, having health problems, I've, I've seen a lot of benefits happen for people from increasing their vitamin D level. So I do still think that there are benefits to vitamin D supplement. Um, and so if you can't get a light, if you can't go outside for some reason, or maybe that's going to require a longer term lifestyle change for you, then I think vitamin D supplementation can have an important role uh, for people whose lifestyles are maybe limited. But um, remember that having a more well-rounded supplement with vitamin A and K is going to be safer and probably more beneficial. And monitoring your levels is always a good idea. So that's all I have for tonight. Thank you very much.